It's the only wrestling podcast on earth with one two-time MLB All-Star Comeback Player of the Year, the head coach himself, Dimitri Young. What's going on, D? That is beautiful entrance right there. I love that introduction. And I have my uh, hot rod shirt on tonight. All right, nice. Oh, that's all I get? Yeah. Just a little head nod, that's it? We got to keep the show going, man. We can't have it to be the Dimitri Young Hour. Hey, but this is, if this was D-Max, it will say pop rod. Ah, <laughs> well, know. he's got four Stanley Cups. It was 420. It's D Mac, Darren McCarty. What's going on? I'm, I'm doing great, boys. I'm wearing my Bob Probert shirt tonight, just in the in the honor of the, the tough yeah. guys. And uh, it's a pleasure, especially today. Real excited uh, for our guests. So, always good to talk to you guys. Let's get her going. He's one of the most influential figures in punk rock history one of my favorite bands rancid it's lars Fredrickson. how's it going everyone it's so excited to be here tonight yeah. and he's won a couple x division championships he's the man behind the man behind the man who the man is actually on the podcast pd williams introduce the man well uh, let me introduce how's she going eh first and then uh let's not forget about you our our host our producer the other man uh, the undisputed Dennis Farrell. And then we got a guy, our, our special guest today, probably my favorite guest ever, a uh, guy I used to call dad, even though we're like really close in age, just he's that kind of father figure to me. Uh, you know, the, the vice president of Impact Wrestling, Scott Demore. Scott, how you doing? Hey, hey man, great, Petey. That's a hell of an intro and uh, glad to be here with you guys. Right. Pete, why don't you lead her off? Okay, well, I'm going to, since I know everybody's going to ask questions about rebellion and stuff, I'm wearing my rebellion shirt happening this Sunday, uh, April 25th, uh, probably our biggest pay-per-view ever, but I want to take it back um, a little bit with you, Scott, uh, Canadian Destroyer, but I'm not talking about the move, I'm talking about Doug Chevalier, a lot of people don't know that, you know, he, he was the, one of the, the startups, I guess, at, to Can-Am Wrestling School and stuff, big influence on, on your career, uh, so Doug Chevalier, Canadian Destroyer, that was his name. Uh, my first independent show ever was the memorial show for, for Doug Chevalier. And so how much would you say that Doug was influential on your career, Can-Am school, um, that kind of thing? Man, I'll, t- I'll tell you what, it's one of those things. Uh, Doug was a, was, was, a pretty, was a pretty simple, laid-back guy, and I think it would blow his mind to, to know how his tentacles have reached throughout the wrestling industry. And uh, I had a great conversation years ago with Jim Ross, where he, he equated wrestling and the, the type of family tree we have in wrestling to that of like a coaching tree in, uh, in sports. And, and uh, for Doug, if you look at it, there's no Doug Chevalier, there's no Scott Demore, which means, you know, not that saying you guys wouldn't appear somewhere else, but if you look at the tree as you go down, you know, you, you have Petey Williams, you have Chris Saban, you have Rhino, you have, you have just have so many people that, have, that you know, as you stretch out beyond that, it's, uh, it's an unbelievable reach. Uh, I remember thinking and I remember choking up when you first uh, told me what, uh, what the name of the flip pile driver was because it, uh, when you told me what it was and why, I mean, it was missed yet. I just, I could just imagine Doug sitting there thinking like, I can't believe that there's a move that people all over the world equate with the Canadian destroyer, because he was the type of guy who would just, you know, he didn't, he didn't have a, a, a superstar career. You know, he, he had a good career, but what he was, was he was a, he was a teacher, he was a coach, he was a mentor and uh, sadly, we lost him young, far too young. But uh, the reach he's had on this business is huge. And uh, I can certainly say if it wasn't for Doug, there'd be no me because I was 16 years old. I was clumsy. I was lazy. And uh, he took the time to push me when I needed to push me, to encourage me when I needed to encourage me. And one of the things you can't do anymore, slap me when I needed to be slapped. And uh, so I owe him so much and uh, miss him every day. Kind of like PD, because I know the rest of these guys will jump in with Rebellion and, and what the impact it'll have going forward. But my question for you is that I've gotten to know you over the couple of years through PD. And PD, one of the questions he likes to ask people is when you win the championship, when did you know? But when did you know you were going to be the turning point for impact? You were there in its highs and lows. You were the cornerstone of the turnaround. 
when when did you get the news or the the you know someone approached you to say hey we want you to come back home we want you to be part of the turnaround yeah i mean it kind of happened in phases right like i was out of the wrestling business and uh and double j you know jeff jarrett kind of kind of got his his hook into me a little bit with global force and that and we were doing some things and then when jeff came back to impact then, uh, I mean, he, he called me right away and I kind of said no. And we chatted a little bit and I, I kind of said, I'd come down for two days, which was turned into three, which turned into, Hey, can you come back in a couple weeks, which tuned in? Hey, you were here when we kind of brainstormed all this. Can you be there when we shoot it? Which, you know, led to me being there for months and months. And then when Jeff had his well-documented, um, situation there. Uh, you know, Anthem Sports and Entertainment was was new to the wrestling industry, had no background in it, never intended to own a wrestling company. And the guy in Jeff, who they had basically picked to be the guy to do it, um, was no longer an option. And it, it, kind of, it kind of morphed from there. And I mean, really, it's, uh, it bored. And they were trying to figure out what they were going to do with the asset, with Impact Wrestling. And, uh, you know, I had a pretty frank conversation with uh, Len Asper and Ed Norholm, who were, you know, Len's our CEO, Ed is, uh, is the executive vice president of, of Anthem Sports and Entertainment. He's our president of Impact Wrestling. And, I mean, my conversation was kind of with him, like, you know, like, decide what you want to do. You want to keep running? You want to keep running? You want to sell? Sell. Like, anyone who tells you don't sell, like, to hell with them. You're running a business. Uh, you know, my plan was really to kind of oversee a transition team and put a put a group together to run Impact Wrestling for Anthem Sports. And and Len and Ed kind of said, uh, you know, hey, like as we're looking at doing things, we'd really like you to consider being part of that solution. So that's uh, that's when I really rolled up my sleeves and said I'm going to get back in it. And, you know, the Don Callis came on board. You know, late 17 as we're looking at doing all this, and it's it's been a it's been a slow and steady and, and gradual, you know, build. Like we've always said, no overnight fixes, no magical formulas. It's just going to be hard work and it's going to be consistent time. And for, you know, like guys, you know, that are on this call that are athletes, you know, you know it. It's like you've seen teams that have tried to buy success and that rarely works. You can buy a piece or two, but if you're really going to have success, it happens through the draft, it happens through development. And that's what uh, we've been looking to do. And that's why we're pretty proud of where we are in 2021. I think that that's such a great point, but I want to ask you a question is because there's obviously you love wrestling and because that's what you do what you do, but where you're at right now with the forbidden door and just how it's built up. And I, and I know, cause if you have that attitude about building it, then, then you have seen this sort of coming, but as the wrestling fan, what is the, what is the fa your favorite part? of what you do or what you what you watch like as scott demore the hardest working guy behind the scenes has to know everything do you get to enjoy actually what's going on out there like the, yeah. the process that you've built yeah i mean look i mean there's a lot of people that get no credit that work very hard and uh i i love sitting there and looking at it at the end of the day above everything else i consider myself a, co a coach i consider myself a teacher uh, whether it's in the ring or whether it's not, and whether it's watching guys like Petey and contemporaries of him or the new, you know, crop coming up and the Joe Dorings or whether it's the younger guys coming up or, or working with talent that I didn't necessarily train from day one, but comes to impact and developing in them, or whether it's behind the scenes people, whether it's a guy like Dan Rael, who I first met as a kid and he's now our vice president of production or Johnny Bravo, who I think a couple of you have met, who Johnny Bravo is the guy who people laughed on in Independence, but he just, he worked so damn hard. Like he's literally the Rudy story, um, but in professional wrestling and people mocked him, but he, you know, he showed up for 25 years every single Monday to train. Like his wife fell down a flight of stairs while she was pregnant. He drove her to the hospital got her checked in, made sure he was okay, gave her a kiss and said, okay, I got to go. She goes, where are you going? He goes, well, it's Monday. I'm going to Canada. Like I trained to wrestle. So, wow. you know, to see this, yeah, to see people like that who have that love and passion and dedication and being able to be part of giving them an opportunity to do something they love and something that they dream of doing. I would say that's the most rewarding part is, is, uh, is seeing that. And then of course, also getting, you know, some of the stories and you've all heard them as athletes and entertainers and everything. 
Um, those stories from fans who tell you like, Hey, I was in a bad place, you know, at one point in my life and, you know, turning on, you know, I looked forward to Thursday nights to seeing, you seeing, you know, TNA impact or impact wrestling or whatever. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, that really helped me. Um, you know, that type of stuff really makes it worth it. So, I mean, it really is the amount of people that you get to reach out to both directly and, and sometimes the ones that you, indirectly you don't really realize that you're getting a chance to touch. Hey, Scott, I've been watching Impact since way back when, when they were NWA, when you two were together, you and Petey with Team Canada, and watching the different ownership and different people running it. The best thing that could have happened is you taking over because before then it was Billy Corgan and I thought he did a great job but when you and Don Callis came in like you said it was going to be hard work and it wasn't going to be a quick easy fix so where were you going to get some of your talent from that is currently stars today like Tierra Hogan and and Ace Austin Chris Bay guys like that that are the future like what it did you go scouting yourself or did you have fillers out there? It's definitely a combination of both. Like, look, we have some amazing people. Like I said, uh, you know, we have, we have D'Lo Brown. who has been, uh, been one of my best friends and true brothers for over 25 years. My, my mother calls him her mocha son. Um, <laughs> you know, he's, 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 He's he's been there at the dinner table for Thanksgiving dinner. He's a member of this family. Um, you know, people like that, people like Gail Kim, who I have a 20, you know, year history with 20 plus years now. Um, and 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 people like that. And then other people, whether it be Lance Storm or whether it be people I met along the way, and we we like Sammy Callahan's and such like that. A lot of it is getting to see them in person. A lot of it is people putting them in front of you and, and saying, Hey, here's a Here's a guy, here's a hint, not tweeting at me about the talent is, is, is uh, you know, if you tweet at me about the talent, probably not the best way if I don't know you. But look, if a Lance Storm or, uh, <laughs> or, or somebody like that says, hey, here's, here's somebody to look at, obviously referrals and stuff like that uh, come through. And then I look, look, I love it. I just, uh, I just got out there and did my first two, uh, my first two seminars that I've done in years. And uh, got to see, you know, over the course of two days, got to see like close to 100 uh, aspiring, you know, wrestlers who are, who are out there grinding it on the indies and trying to make it in this pandemic world uh, and getting to see them. And that's the type of process. That's where I first saw Chris Bay is uh, we, did a, we, did a, we did a seminar in Las Vegas. Yeah. And I mean, just like, a, I mean, a diamond shining, he was still and I mean, to, to see where he was there. And then where he's he's grown to in such a short time, like that, like Chris Bay is going to be a star in wrestling. Ace Austin is going to be a star. I think they're already stars, but they're just at the very beginning of their stardom. And and talent like that is gonna is just gonna continue to grow and and learn. Um, you know, Kira Hogan. I won't say the name, but it was actually it's funny. There was a there was a different talent who sent me a match of theirs that they, they were looking for an opportunity and their opponent in that match was Kira <laughs> Hogan. And uh, I was, I was watching that and I was like, I was like, I was like, damn, like, you know, like the opponent is really one. Kira is the one, like there's something there. And she was so young, you know, and so, and so inexperienced, but you've seen her blossom with time and, and just so many of it. So it really is a combination. It's it, whether it's directly through me or the team or either it's, it's people outside of the, the team that make a referral or whatever else, um, you know, we're always on the lookout because there's one thing about professional wrestling, even though it's not pure sport, sport is, uh, is the same as any other sport in the sense that you constantly have to be turning over talent, developing the next generation of talent. And that's the key to success. You, you, you can build a winner, but if you, if you rest on your laurels, that team is going to age and that team is going to diminish so you always have to be replenishing and working with and developing. And uh, we've tried to put a good system in that. And that's one of the reasons why we look to have a good working relationship with so many companies is so that we get a chance to see them directly or indirectly or people say, oh man, like I saw this guy, like this guy was on our show and he's so good. I want him to go to Impact because I know Impact are gonna handle him properly. I know they're gonna look after him. They're gonna develop him. And I think that's really one of the things we've been really good at. I think we've developed young talent i also think when you look at some of the talent that's been around for years like uh, respectfully a guy like uh, johnny impact john morrison 
who's been around for years, but I think we were able to get a little more out of him than you saw from him in, in, in other places. You know, you're, you're seeing that now with a guy like Brian Myers, like Brian Myers is a season polished pro, but we're working with them, you know, both directly and part of it, just giving him the opportunity saying it's okay to try stuff. It's okay to do something different, you know, here, talk, do these things, try. And if it doesn't work, we'll do it again. And uh, working and collaborating with talent like that in a in an open forum allows somebody like that who's already been on some of the biggest stages in the industry in the world allows him to find a whole new dimension to his game. So I think that's I think that's one of our strengths and one of the things that I'm proudest about about what we've been doing. Well, that was going to be like part of my question is just because across the line, you know, we've had a lot of the talent from from Impact on the show. And one of the questions that I've always asked is how important is that creative freedom? And so, but you're on this other side in, 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 in respect, but, and it sounds like you push these guys to be more creative. Um, but how do you think that has um, helped the company letting these guys figure it out for themselves as being, this is your gimmick. This is what you're gonna do. This is what you're gonna say. This is how it's gonna go. You know, there, it seems like it's a lot more loose there, which makes it more exciting um, and seems to make the product better. Yeah, I mean, I look, I, I think I think having creative, you know, input and involvement and freedoms is certainly something that allows talent to flourish. I think it makes us a, a, an appealing place to uh, to come and be a part of and to to wrestle in uh, as a company. And, and look, I, I think it's key. One, we're a small shop. So we don't have we don't have the deepest bench when it comes to the front office. Uh, so we're, we're not going to be able to to dedicate, you know, everybody to writing out promos, and everything else. But the other thing is we don't want to like let the talent consider that nobody's going to spend more time, you know, contemplating and thinking about what Lars can do to be successful than Lars. So your job and I learned this years ago is there, there's there's two things you have to do as a coach. Uh, one of them is realize that uh, you're not a player anymore. Um, yeah. And that's important too, right? You, you got to want everybody that you're working with to succeed beyond what you've ever been able to do. That's when you, you've made it as a coach is when your, your players, when your athletes are better than you, smarter than you, more prepared than you. And then the other thing you have to realize is because of that, you can't play the game for them. You got to let them play the game. But your responsibility is to give them the tools to su of success. To give them the tools to success, right? You can, you can, you can, you know, Scotty Bowman can lay out the best game plan. He can have the best plays on the power play. He can have the perfect system for penalty killing. But it's going to take those guys. And I mean, look, it pains me to say this because I'm a, I'm a Leafs fan. Sorry, Darren. Um, oh, but wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you, wait, hold on a sec. You just like that was sort of like you. Oh, you know, speaking of Brian Myers, you old did his old gimmick of uh, zero and two hundred by saying you're a Leafs fan. So I, I three bet you and give you a hug and say I'm sorry you're a Leafs fan. Maybe one day you can get there, but I know there's a lot of you out there, and you know what? Guess what? It's gonna be either the Leafs or the Lions first. That's where all the bets are. <laughs> Ooh. You're in that conversation, yeah. right, Dimitri? But oh, you know, man. you're totally you right. the Lions. So, so I was like, that makes more sense <laughs> to me now, Scott, because you know, Dimitri and I are looking at me and we've you know, we've won some things and and stuff like that, but you're completely right about the coaching or about anything else in it. But that shows and to me that the for everything that's going on now the key looking back and Petey and and dennis were there was the first talking shop of mania and then into the second one at the end when you see all this so that's sort of like the hidden door and everything you're talking about but all the, everybody doing everything else and yeah you're right i mean it, you don't have to be sorry to me, bro. I got four cups. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. Well, okay. I always, I, I always say my goal is one of my dreams is life. And I need to know what it's like to watch the Leafs win a Stanley Cup in color because I've only seen black and white footage. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that, <laughs> that, that's important to me. But but what I did get to see is look, I was at the Olympia as a child. I grew up at the Joe Louis Arena. It was it was my home. Uh, I was there from from when it opened in 1980. To, to when they, they tore it down recently with, you know, had a tear in my eye. Uh, I miss the Olympia club. I miss all the people there, but uh, you know, I, I love good hockey. So watching those, the, you know, you guys over the years was great. And I gotta, I gotta tip my hat to you on wearing the Bob Probert shirt. Cause I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, my cousin, Danny Probert, uh, Bob's that wife. Cousin? Yes. So, that's my, that's, so that's my we're cousin. We're tight. We're, we're and the kids and everything like that. So yeah. I'll uh, make sure, like, I talk to her all the time, and then we, that's the one thing is we're all, like, you know, it, it's like family, and, and I think that the culture that you see is that, it, especially in the impact, and little insight, because obviously I picked Petey's brain, but it's that culture of winning, right, where you're, it's bigger than your, yourself and everything you preach, and, and that's what, to your Leafs, Right. Here's the thing. Sorry to take it away. But the other day when Zach Hyman and Adler hit some knee on me, right. Somebody should have jumped on him, whatever else. Like that's the spark that that lead team's missing the camaraderie, the different things, sort of the faction thing is like jumping in and asking questions later. Right. That yeah. to your hockey question, when you see that moment happen, like we did March 26, then it'll happen for you, but you're doing it. You're making it happen. So maybe if the Leafs would watch Impact Wrestling <laughs> Rebellion this Saturday night when Sunday. Kenny Omega takes on Rich Swan and Rich Swan better win, man, representing that Impact. And we're going to blow it up. Right, Tree? Right, Coach? Coach Hook? Right? Yeah, Rich I Swan. love it. Oh, it's all about I, Swan, baby. It's all well, about hey, the Swan. Th that's what I wanted to ask, Scott. Like, that was literally my next question. All right? We got the main event at Rebellion. We got... Uh, Kenny Omega, we got Rich Swan. Uh, everybody keeps asking, like, well, you know, what, what if Kenny wins? Like, you know, what what happens? You know, will he be on impact? Will he bring it to AEW? Everybody's asking that question. Nobody's really asking, like, all right, so Scott, what if Rich wins? What, what does that mean to impact? What does that mean to you as his boss? What happens, what happens next? Now we have a, the AEW championship on impact. What happens? Yeah, and I mean, look, we, we uh, one of the members in the media asked that in our press conference that we had uh, last week, and I think it's a great question. And the fact is, it's been worked out. The, the, both championships uh, are, are prizes in our industry, and no matter what, like, somebody's not losing a champion on Sunday. There'll certainly be bragging rights over which guy wins, but at the end of the day, whoever walks out at the end of night is going to be the Impact World Champion and is going to be the AEW World Champion. And me and Tony have both commented on the record. The fact is that the, we're, we're committed to those titles being, you know, uh, respectively defended and represented on each show. So whoever walks out of this Sunday at Rebellion is, as the dual champion is going to be on Dynamite on Wednesday night. And then they're going to be on Impact on Thursday night. And, uh, you know, that's going to be the, the plan going forward. We, we all know what the what the stakes are but i mean look i want rich to win and anyone who's been around with rich knows that as both a athlete and as a human being it just doesn't get any better than uh than rich swan so i think as a company we've rallied behind him and certainly if you're as a guy who may have kept a book or two in my day um i would say that the odds are probably on the board against him and the money's probably coming in against him but that makes for uh, some of the the greatest moments in sports, right? There's no miracle on ice if there's not uh, everybody thinking that the big bad Russians are gonna are gonna mop up the uh, the Americans. You just you know those those moments uh, are made and upsets upsets are what we what we remember. So in this Sunday, I mean, the fact is we've got an amazing card from top to bottom, but obviously everybody's you know uh, real fixated on title versus title, Omega versus Swan. AEW versus Impact, it's going to be amazing. And that's why I'm so excited to have a good friend of mine who I first met in Stampede Wrestling back in 2000, 2000. Mauro Ronaldo, the greatest yeah. announcer yeah. in combat sports. He's going to, it's going to be history Sunday. And we've got it. We've got the greatest combat sports announcer in, 
in history providing the soundtrack, the commentary when those moments are made. So super excited about that. And uh, I just think it's going to be uh, a great night. PD, you'll be there. Hey, I wish all the others of you could be too. Uh, as soon as they're allowed, like, please come be our guests and, uh, and uh, come be part of it. And uh, it's going to be awesome, man. I'm looking forward to Sunday and you just, you just go on, right? You have the good brothers and pin juice an unbelievable tag match. You know, you have Tiana and Deanna swearing off for the knockouts title. I mean, you have uh, you have just so much just going going up and down the, the card. I think it's uh, I think it's good. I, I think it's a stack show from from top to bottom with a historic main event that I think people are going to be talking about for a long time. Now, you, you we've talked about the Forbidden Door. You mentioned a couple of New Japan guys here and there. AEW, of course, about three months ago, two months ago, we had Rocky Romero on. And he said, from the New Japan standpoint, this whole relationship between all the companies is kind of thin ice for them. From the impact standpoint, several months later, how do you feel the relationships are progressing between the companies? Does it still feel like, you know, Bambi on thin ice or are you guys progressing much more than we know? I mean, look, I, I think what we're doing is, is, is pretty close to unprecedented in the modern era used to be like territories could have good relationships, but they didn't cross over very much business wise, other than on rare occasion, as it is right now. Like, I think we've been able to, uh, you know, maneuver through some tricky waters with AEW. I mean, there's always going to be politics. There's always going to be egos. There's always going to be issues that come up with scheduling and everything else. I think we've done a really great job of working through that. And when you peel back all the layers and all the showbiz, I think that Tony and his team, uh, and us and our team have done a really great job of trying to to work through those. Uh, look, that New Japan relationship, I mean, it's no secret, was so badly destroyed in the TNA years. Um, you know, and we've spent we've spent years literally since Anthem Sports, you know, um, took over trying to rebuild that relationship. And it's been a it's been a long, hard battle. Obviously, the good brothers coming in helped uh, melt the uh, the coldness and the ice on that relationship. And I, I think so far it's been, uh, it's been a good relationship. You know, you've seen TJP and Chris Bay appear uh, so far only on their LA shows because of the, the travel restrictions going to Japan. You know, the good brothers are going to be working for both companies and there's, there's multiple talks about uh, talent, you know, continuing to come this way from Japan and talent from here, uh, you know, from impact going over to Japan. So uh, look, I think it's it's going to be one of those things that's much like I look at the New Japan relationship, much the way we looked at all the relationships when we took over Impact was people have been have been mistreated, you know, respectfully, in their opinion, from previous uh, regimes and Impact been 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 pro given promises that weren't delivered. So part of what we have to do with New Japan and everybody else is what we've done with everybody, tried to do with everybody we've dealt with in the last few years is tell you what we're going to do and then follow through and do it. And that's what we've been doing with New Japan. That's what we've been doing with AEW. And I'd certainly be remiss if I didn't say our great partners at AAA in Mexico, who have been unbelievably supportive and, uh, and collaborative with us over the last few years. So I think, uh, I think we really have a great group coming together of, uh, of like-minded people in the industry running major companies that are all uh, you know, willing to sit there and look at ways to collaborate. I think that's one of the coolest parts of 2021. The one thing that I like to do when we uh, have guests on the show is go back in their history and what made you, you. So who, who did you like? As a wrestler growing up, was it because uh, you grew up in Canada, so you had a lot of Canadians to, to worship, so to speak. So um, who are the guys that you like that influence you into the wrestling business? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm 46, so there's no way that anybody my age wasn't influenced one way or the other by Hulk Hogan because he uh, he was a, a game changing, uh, you know, individual in our sport. Uh, but I mean, like, like, yeah, like I got swept up all the Hulkamania stuff, but to me, uh, Arn Anderson was the man was a huge, was a huge double a fan. You know, him and Tully were an amazing team, uh, honky tonk man for the, the cockiness. He was the, he was the, he was like one of those guys who I thought was just, uh, was just so outlandish, but, but so good. And like, you could look at a guy like you could look at Arn and Tully and you could be like, man, these are the guys are the absolute best, but honky was a guy who you're like, 
like literally this guy should lose every match and the thing that drives you is he does it right like it is part of that cocky crazy attitude of his you know uh, certainly he was somebody who uh, who a lot and then obviously brett of course is uh as we got a little farther along as a big heart foundation fan and uh brett was so good and obviously the fact that he was canadian at a time when there wasn't a ton of canadians when you turn on wrestling on tv obviously i gravitated towards him and uh, now knowing him as an individual gravitate even more towards him you know so th those are the people as a, as a kid and then i always say like go back to the coaching tree thing you know jody hamilton who was the masked assassin Terry Taylor, Chief J. Strongbow, the, the fact that these 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 legends uh, and these these individuals who are so good at what they do took the time to 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 talk to and and you know the fact that Jody Hamilton would call me and tell me to send him tape for him to watch and break down. The fact that Chief J. Strongbow would call me when he'd get back from Raw and talk about what happened there. And I mean, you know, and both those guys booked me on so many events for WF and WCW. Terry Taylor, who taught me so much in the ring, but also is the guy who taught me how to produce, you know, uh, wrestling for television, everything else. When when WCW shut down, you know, and PD uh, was, was well, this probably predated PD Access, I think about it. He was up in Canada helping me, uh, you know, format and produce Border City Wrestling Television uh, less than 30 days after he got let go when WCW shut down. So so many people you know what's the the old saying it takes uh it takes a village to 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 raise a, a child and i guess even in, in this case it takes a village even to raise an idiot because i might be the village idiot but damn it i'm out there doing it every day it, scott one of the questions is take it to your talent your scouting eye <clears throat> who are some of the people coming through impact maybe that the fans aren't totally knowledgeable about right now or that have a bright future that we can sort of get a you know get a glimpse in but who do you who do you think are the breakout stars I guess I'm always looking to see who's the next thing coming I mean I think we touched a little earlier on Chris Bay who I think has 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 all the tools to be a star and has an unbelievable amount of charisma and is just coming into his own and Ace Austin, who I think the same thing. I mean, you look at it in a short time of a couple of years, how he's developed. I think a guy like Joe Doring, who's certainly not young and is headlined in front of 15,000 plus at the Sumo Arena and other places in Japan, but is really getting his first opportunity in front of an American crowd. Uh, I think, you know, here's a dark horse for you. If you've been watching our show weekly, there's somebody who's made a couple of appearances, a young guy by the name of Sam Beal, who uh, is as green and raw as can be. But uh, he's certainly uh, he's certainly showing some of the signs of somebody who could develop into a talent. So he may he may turn out to be the next megastar in wrestling. He may fizzle out and disappear like so many others. But he is he's somebody who's a guy we have our eye on. And I mean, he's got a great attitude. He's an unbelievable athlete. Doesn't hurt that he's getting in the ring and working with a good friend of mine in PDs and in, in uh, Alex Shelley, who's an unbelievable coach uh, to be to be working with and him having that that at his disposal is certainly going to help him. So, um, you know, there's a few guys at different levels that I just mentioned and, and the women. And, you know, like I said, uh, you know, Kira is, uh, you know, and, and also Tasha, like Tasha has been overlooked for far too long. Um, you know, there was one of those moments where she was at one of our shows visiting and I turned and looked at Gail and I was like, well, wh why, why isn't she somewhere? Like, she's so good. She's so good in the ring. And she's so, she's so good personality wise. Like what, why isn't she on TV? You know, like I actually, when she was there, I assumed she was signed somewhere else just coming to say hello. And, uh, and Gail's like, no, like she's looking for work. I was like, well, well damn it. Like, let's sketch out a contract on that <laughs> kid and let's sign her. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I have uh, an opinion, an observation and a question. So I want to start with the with the opinion and it's and it's it's my hat is off to you guys because the way that you guys have built the swan omega match i mean this is like shades of 1980s wrestling where it, it there's a story being told and you have to you have to to tune in to get the whole to the whole point of the story and it's like that's something that's that's sort of been gone from professional wrestling for so long the observation is that at forbidden door it's like kicked wide open and it's 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 moved tna out of this like stopover place 
for the next place to go. In my opinion, it seems like it's now, it's like, it's like a, it's a real place. So when I hear people say it's that it's kind of like the minor leagues or a step over, it's, that's not the, the case anymore. My question to you is, do you ever sit back and look at this and go, where the fuck am I going to go from here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's yeah, there's been there's been a few of those moments, you know. It's 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 like in 2018, uh, I didn't I didn't think. I mean, obviously, like all of us that are in in sports or entertainment, I have a, a massive ego, uh, no shock. So I mean, I didn't think we were going to fail, but there was no guaranteed success in 2018. There was definitely the option that you know Anthem was going to take a look and say, hey, you know what, we tried this. Let's let's, you know, we've got really good offers on the table to, to purchase this asset and, you know, and they could have cut it, moved on. Uh, you know, we got past that. It's like, okay, like we made it through that initial hump. What do we got to do now? Well, we got to continue to build. So we did, we did that through 19 and then 2020 and, you know, this pandemic for all the issues it's caused gave us that opportunity that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise had as we led into anniversary of last year. And bringing in uh, two guys who are two very good friends of mine uh, in the Good Brothers. I've known I've known Carl Anderson since he first broke in in Ohio under a good friend of mine, Roger Ruffin, who I learned so much from. And, uh, you know, I was Doc Gallo's agent for a few years. I'm the one that, you know, sent him to New Japan to get his career on the track that it should be. So having guys like that join and doing that. And then, then what's next? Well, shit. Well, then we sit down and we... We start planning it out and, you know, like it finally, you know, after all the, the, the talks over the course of years, you know, we're able to, to do the stuff with Kenny and uh, Don because of that relationship that Don and Kenny have that is a unique, uh, you know, like mentor and, and uh, you know, student type of relationship and, and that, that, that opens up things at AEW and then, you know, finally the frost, you know, subsides and, you know, we're getting some places with New Japan. So, you know, Impact Wrestling was, was was so unstable for so long. One of the things that I'm proudest about is the fact that we brought stability to it. And acquiring, you know, as I put on my Anthem Sports and Entertainment hat, acquiring Access TV is huge. Uh, means that there's a there's a home for Impact Wrestling today, tomorrow, and beyond. Um, it also means, you know, the value of Impact, as I look at it, and I look at it from an Access lens, to have a program that 52 weeks a year comes on and does uh, does does pretty darn solid numbers is is, is a huge value um and it, it helps give value and prestige to its impact within the anthem portfolio and then we continue to grow like just you know recently there was the announcement that we acquired invicta fc so having invicta fc you know the a promotion that has really done so much for women's mma and having them involved it's you know it's it's a continual growth both in and outside of impact what what's next well can't wait to get back in front of people you know we were we had had some great events like uh bound for glory in chicago and then hard to kill in uh in dallas you know two sold out events in great markets and in, in, in amazing buildings and we were seeing a lot of momentum in that direction i mean i think we want to continue to do that and we want to continue to grow one of the things that we've done and we've been at the forefront of for many years and for all the knocks against some of the, the previous uh, regimes or administrations, TNA and Impact has always been at the forefront on, on the digital front. And we want to continue to grow that. I mean, with Impact Plus as our own, uh, you know, in-house platform and working with other ones. Like we have, a, we have a channel on Pluto TV that does gangbusters and so many other platforms. So, I mean, it, it's broadcast. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the digital side of things. It's, I mean, you know, it, it's uh, as you look at it now and you look how people consume content, it's no longer people sitting down and, and scheduled viewing in front of a TV. It's on TV, it's on DVR, it's, it's on your tablet, it's on your phone, it's, it's whatever it is. And we want to continue to grow that model and we want to continue to try things and be different. One of the places that tries to innovate, and that means sometimes we're going to try things that don't work and that's okay, we'll move on for them from them and we'll but we'll find things that are a success we'll find our ultimate x's you know we'll find our things that are going to going to going to grow and become part of this industry and uh and we'll continue to provide a platform for men and women to succeed um and we're going to continue to go out there and uh, continue to grow so i mean look one day we want to be in a, a soul a sold out uh arena or stadium in front of you know 10 or 12 or 15,000 people we want to go out there we want to continue to deliver content around the world and grow that we, you know we've got a we've got very strong international distribution like uh 
You know, there's a lot of companies that have stuff in the U.S. or in North America, but we're out there. We're in Africa. We're in the U.K. You know, we're in we're in so many of these other places. And we want to continue to to grow and, and and prosper in that both both on a linear broadcast level and also on a on a you know a digital and an OTT level and everything else. So not to bore everybody with the technology, but that that's where we're going, and we want to be at the the forefront of that. We spend a lot of, of time working on that. And trying to make sure that we can do the most we can to feature our athletes and our product to as many people around the world, because we truly are in a global market. So uh, speaking of growth, like recently, Impact just added uh, BTI before the Impact. All right. So I guess my question is a two part question. One is, you know, what what made you decide like, hey, we should add another hour? Um, Because it seems like, you know, that's the. uh, I I guess the the norm for wrestling companies do now is, hey, let's add, add another hour. So that's question a, I guess. Question B is, you know, one of the big, not missed opportunities, but we had a big TNA show booked uh, last in, in 2020. Then the, you know, COVID happened and stuff like that. And obviously, people still want to see that. Has there been thought of like, hey, maybe we should have a TNA show as an extra show? Yeah, there's mm. certainly been there's certainly been conversations about that, and I, I I still get hit up on on Twitter and that from fans saying, hey. Are we are we ever going to get that that TNA reunion um, show that uh, I think you know so many people were looking forward to seeing? And I think we saw even with the one hour like hype show we did, we did that one hour special yeah. on uh, on access that we did in the ten o'clock time slot. Um, certainly, I mean that the the buzz created by that it was it was three or four days later when I got a call from, 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 a, you know, one of our, our fellow access departments basically saying, Hey, like how, how hard would it be? Like, would it be possible for you to, to do this weekly? You know? And it's kind of like, Ooh, like, uh, like it, it is, it is like when, what are we talking about timeline? And they were like, well, I mean, would you be able to, would you be able to do it by next month? And I was like, no, cause you got to think about it in April of last year. I'm like, where the hell are we going? Like, we're running out of shows. Like we need to find a place to run shows in, in the next two weeks. And you're asking me to, to do something like that. No, but it, it, as we come out of this pandemic environment and get back out there, certainly that's a possibility. You know, it's a possibility that the TNA brand could, could return. I think it's one of the things that, you know, uh, many and certainly not at the top of the list, but one of the things that maybe the pandemic has robbed us of is that opportunity to see a return of TNA. You know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be, we have so many unbelievable knockouts. Maybe, maybe we'll end up continue to grow the knockouts division and, and, and give them their own separate platform. And uh, I mean, I know you're saying it, it's easy because BTI is pretty high profile since it, it airs right before impact. But remember, we started with two hours on on uh, access. Then we added Impact and 60 in the 10 o'clock hour. Now that's three hours weekly on Impact. Then we added in BTI, that's four hours plus because we have such an unbelievable library with so much amazing legacy content and unbelievable history in that library. We now, when you, when you tune into Access on Thursdays, you get one of our historical pay-per-views you know, out of our catalog mm-hmm. that airs from three to seven. Then from seven to eight, you have BTI. Then from eight to 10, you have the Impact flagship show. Then from 10 to 11, you have uh, you have Impact and 60. And then now you even add quarterly, you look at it now, we've done, we've done the, you know, the This Is Rebellion, which is our, which is our third kind of like road to show that we've done leading into our, 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 our big like tentpole pay-per-views as we call them, our four, like the quarterly pay-per-views, the mega shows that we do. Uh, that's been added. You saw that uh, just, you know, that just this week, you saw that uh, me and Josh Matthews hosted a very special edition of, of uh, Impact and 60 to give it a little bit of a twist. And you've got like, we've now got our second uh, edition of Badass Movies with the Good Brothers. So, uh, I mean, I just, you look at it, I, I think you've seen to continue to see that growth and and that's what's happening on on Access, but then, you know, not to, not to dwell on it, but again, all those properties then start to filter in and be seen around the world. So it's not just in the U S you see it on fight here. You know, you see it on Sony in India, you know, you see it, you see it in, uh, in uh, Africa, you see it everywhere else. And you see, as we go out there and get the product, all of this product is getting out there and it's all becoming, it all gets added to what's available on impact plus, which is, is growing by leaps and bounds that switch to those, 
Impact Plus shows being full-blown pay-per-view quality shows, which is one of the things that the pandemic, again, allowed us to do, has really seen exponential growth with Impact Plus. And that's, uh, that's a huge part of our, our future. You look at it and you go and, and look what WWE did. Look what, when they launched WWE Network, people like almost scoffed at them. And they said, what are you, they're giving up like millions and millions and millions in pay-per-views. But I mean, one thing about WWE, for all the negatives people like to point out, they have some long-term vision and they knew where it was going. And look at what WWE Network is now and what they've built. And that's, that's the direction we're heading. That's part of being forward thinking and making sure we're growing for the future so that we're not just succeeding today, but we're succeeding today, tomorrow, and beyond. We, we got time for one more question apiece for us before we wrap this up. And I'm going to you've, – you've hit on it a few times, the fans. MLW just announced that they're going back to touring in July. Any, any plans for impact going back in front of the fans in the near future? Look, we've been looking at it for, for geez, almost you know, a year now, basically. Uh, there was a point where I thought that Slammiversary of last year, we might have, we might have fans. And then it was, like, it was like bound for glory, we might have fans. Uh, definitely, we're keeping an eye on it. We're continuing to, to look at that and monitor it. Uh, one thing, the decision we've made on the Anthem level is that uh, we'd rather be a day late than a day early in this situation. So uh, we're definitely look at it, looking at it, want to get back in, in, in front of fans. And actually, over the course of the last month, I've, I've been crisscrossing you know, some areas looking at new venues and places that we could do live events and also reconnecting with some of the, the great venues like the arena in Philadelphia and everything else that out there so that we can get back out of there in fans. Because certainly nobody, um, you know, wants to see wrestling continue indefinitely or forever in front of no fans. There's such a huge part of, you know, our industry and such a huge part of the experience of viewing uh, wrestling that that obviously we want to get back up, back out there in front of them and having them in the building cheering us on and being part of that uh, that presentation of the product. So uh, like yeah, absolutely can't wait. But uh, we're gonna do it. We're gonna continue to evaluate it and when it can be done safely and effectively, can't wait for it. All right, my well, last question is uh, the curiosity kills the cat right here. I am very curious about your relationship with Tony Khan and how was it when you first met him? Uh, I mean, look, I mean, there's the, you hear a lot of things and everything else meeting him. I can say this, like the people that I trust, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, like Tommy dreamer and the young bucks and guys like that, they'd all said, you know, the people I talked to that I really valued their opinions. And look, he's a great guy. And he is, you know, Tony, I don't think I'm speaking out of school here to say Tony could ne could go through his life and never lift a finger. And I think he's probably going to eat. Okay. Um, <laughs> but but he, he, he is a, you know, like, uh, like when you the cameras aren't there and it's not the character stuff, he is a, he is a, he's a, he's a, like just a really decent human being. He's a good dude. And like all of us that are on this pod right now, he loves wrestling. He loves it. He's passionate about it. You know, this is a guy who could do whatever he wants to do with his life. And he chose to be sub just completely submerged in this business to a point that, you know, you almost want to like, there's days that I think about shake, like I shake my head and go, what the hell am I doing? You know, and this guy could literally crisscross the, the world on a private jet, just doing whatever he wanted day by day. And he rolls up his sleeve and he attacks, you know, the professional wrestling industry and uh it's a it's a true passion of his and he has a he has a great deal of respect uh for the wrestling industry and he has a great understanding and appreciation for its history so um you know look if there if there comes a day when you know it doesn't make sense business wise for for impact and, and aw to to be like you know completely intertwined in doing business together i don't think there'll ever be a day or i don't see it i don't think it'll happen i hope it doesn't happen just couldn't see there wouldn't be a day where he wouldn't be somebody that could pick up the phone and, you know, like if he called, I'd always be happy. He'd always be a, a uh, you know, a friendly acquaintance and somebody that I have respect for. And, uh, you know, hats off to him. You know, they've, uh, they've done a lot of great things in the business. And I, I, I think that, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, a unique, he's a unique character. And there's, there's, there's never been anybody like that who, who, just could like literally, you know, whatever they want at whatever m m minute of the day. 
and he chooses to spend hours. And I mean, I'm a night owl. PD knows that he's probably gotten texts from me at three, four in the morning. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Tony's up working those hours too. So uh, the props to him for putting in that work. I think Scott, that the, the fact is a lot. Um, what I see is exactly what you say, the impact wrestling and what you, the brand knows who they are and embraces who they are and embraces and the appreciation. Now, I know the, the gig now in, in other places is to bring in celebrities or change up the commentary that I'm just going to sit here and offer that you always have us guys. I know you already have Petey. Now, I just want to inform you, it'll probably be more of three men and a baby than the four horsemen, but as far as commentary or the history or anything you need for any of this promotion moving forward, uh, we're all in because we already wrote down that we get the invite to the places. But um, as a fan, it's awesome to hear because the true love of it and just hearing from the different guys and, you know, uh, like the Doc Gallows and the guys that you mentioned of how much, uh, like Dimitri said when we interview guys, how much they appreciate it, but the freedom they have to try different things. And that's the brilliance of watching – everybody uh be the best that they can so i just want to say thanks and keep doing what you're doing i'll keep following the storylines so good coming on sunday awesome appreciate it darren and i look forward to a day when we can get together and do a little something been wanting to do it for 20 years we're gonna get there buddy well tommy dreamer i did his podcast after Shaq got slammed through a table so i put it on my bucket list and he promised me that i could he gonna make that happen i figured if anybody got asked the hardcore legend there you go. That's a good route to go. There you go. Thanks. Lars? Uh, well, my last question to you is, is I guess, um, how was this whole idea presented to you to work with other companies and bust down this door? And were you excited about it? Or did you have to, you know, sit back and take it all in? Like, what, how, how, how did you respond and how was it presented to you? I mean, look, really, uh, collaboration is something that I've, I've always believed in, you know, I mean, going back to, and PD will remember this, you know, Border City Wrestling worked with Midwest Territorial Wrestling in Michigan, and, and then, you know, would work with different companies in Ontario, and that's, we originally formed Maximum Pro Wrestling to be an amalgamation of three different wrestling organizations in Ontario, because our, our idea was always stronger together, right? Um, you know, did that on the independent level. Uh, when we were doing Global Force Wrestling, uh, me and Double J were, were really in favor of, of going out there and collaborating and doing joint ventures and events with people. Continued that with Impact Wrestling. You know, if we were going into a, into a market where, uh, you know, there's a, there's a strong local promotion, then why, not, then why not team up? Why not give them an opportunity to be part of the event? And, uh, you know, we'll get more eyeballs on their talent. Um, we get great infrastructure in the market. Then we're also not, we're not coming in and, and, and stepping on what people have done locally. We're including them and collaborating with them. And, and, and that's how we found so many, so much of our talent, whether it's pro wrestling revolver or whether it's FSW out in Vegas or whether it's wrestle pro in the New York area, you know, we worked with a lot of those smaller promotions and then, um, like really great independent promotions. And then the collaboration we've had with AAA over many years like that's a relationship that goes back to the tna asylum days and uh, and dorian's uncle antonio pena who founded AAA. so stuff like that like that really just it, it kind of slow and steady over many years has been one of the, the real principles that that i believe in and it's one of the principles that impact believed in and, and we've we've always kind of said you know we're open to working with anybody and it you know doesn't 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 mean you have to be you know full blown partners with each other. But I think whether it's whether it's you know AEW, whether it's New Japan, whether it's AAA, whether it's you know whether it's Championship Wrestling from Hollywood, you know whether it's whether it's somebody that we do no business with, whether it's you know like like MLW, who's a company that we've done you know like really nothing really directly with. Well, I mean you know uh, you know Court. Bauer and St. Laurent, like we have open communication and, and that's important, right? Like, can you imagine 
can you imagine an industry? Can you imagine a music if nobody communicated on a management level at all? Like, I mean, there has to be, even if you're not collaborating directly, there should at least be communication. And any chance that there, any time that there's a chance to collaborate directly or indirectly and do something that can, can certainly benefit both companies. And, uh, and also like, you know, I say like the best deal isn't a win-win, the best deal is a win-win-win both companies win and the fans win. And I think you stay open to that. And, you know, we're really open to anything that, that makes sense for us. We're, we're proud of what we built. We want to share that. And we're, we're willing to, to sit at the table and work with other parties to do cool stuff. Right. Cause who doesn't like doing stuff that's cool? Who doesn't like that at rebellion for the, the first time in history, no BS, no Vince McMahon owning WCW and WWF, no, no anthem, you know, you know, really having control over over impact and you know GFW and to a sense at the time. Like this is two completely different companies that are not amalgamated, that are not related parties, uh, you know, in a business sense as far as for like ownership or anything else like that, coming together to put this on. It's it's historic, it's cool. And uh, that's why for us the door the door is always open, you know, like you've seen it so many times with different events around the world Let, let's come together at the right times and let's put on kick-ass super shows and sometimes we'll all exist in our own little universe and other times they'll merge and come together it's like it's like a great marvel movie right you can you can enjoy an iron man movie but then you can turn around and you know you can watch an avengers movie and then you can turn around and watch a hulk movie like pick and choose what you want sometimes it's together sometimes it's apart and it's i think it's a, a concept i strongly believe in i think it's one that the fans have fully fully gotten behind rebellion sunday april 25th make sure you guys go out and get it i am definitely going to watch it on pay-per-view dimitri what you got to look yeah i do have a look <laughs> because none of you guys asked this question i'm gonna ask this question scott you're a front office guy now you pay attention to what's going on in the wrestling world correct and what happened right after wrestlemania they had this grand release and um you being a front office guy, I know you have your eyes on some of the prizes that are out there, kind of like last year when they had that mass exodus. Um, are we going to be seeing a return of a certain guy that's been doing commentary on Raw, perhaps? Or are we going to see um, the hot mess return? Um, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look... Um... I know there's a 90 day complete, um, non complete, uh, complete cause, but um, yeah, I want to know. I got it. I, I, uh, I think, I think you look at what we did at Slam Anniversary last year with all the buzz, and I think there's an opportunity here. There's some great talent, and they've got this hiccup in their career. We've, we've all been there probably where we've been, we've been let go in that, and they've got an opportunity to do like so many of the people did last year and forge new opportunities and different and in some ways better opportunities for themselves. Look, in, in 2005, when, uh, when I got put in charge of uh, the creative for TNA, I knew there was, there was one guy that I wanted and that was Samoa Joe. And I worked very hard getting on the phone because WWE wanted him as well. And uh, myself and Mike Tanay, who's an amazing, amazing dude that I know some of you have met and got to be around. Yes. We just we just knew Joe was different and special and we wanted to have him there. And that was 2005. We were able to get him and do some pretty damn cool stuff. Uh, I got mad respect for Samoa Joe and would always love an opportunity to uh, to work with him again, both of, because of his unbelievable talent and his unique charisma and also because he's just a good dude. Um, and so many of that other talent, like you look at it, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce, whether it's, whether it's, you know, Chelsea Green, you know, there's, there's, there's so much there. And, uh, you know, I just got to say, I think there's some chance that some talent's going to move around and uh, you're just gonna have to stay tuned and uh, be careful what I say, but maybe some conversations have started. See, that's why he's got the job he's got, Dimitri. He <laughs> and, and I don't care what you guys say. If the I, if Billy Kay and Peyton Royce show up on Impact and some sort of iconic back together with that charisma, you will get uh, as pop. That might be uh, the female, the, 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 anyway, the knockouts. Anyway, I don't pry. I'm not the coaching department. I'm just here. I just media guy. But uh, I'm looking for the hot mess to return. That character was incredible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. Well, hey, hey, tw- 2020 was for the was for the men. Maybe 2021 is time for the women to step forward and take center stage. Oh, wow. okay. He's, for everybody, he's drop he's dropping little nuggets for you, pal. Yeah. Teasers. Okay. For everybody at home, hey, I pick up all nugs that are dropped around me, geez, so I got them. <laughs> for everybody at home the podcast is over for us we'll say our goodbyes to scott off the air it's a wrestling perspective don't forget rebellion this sunday go get it on pay-per-view scott demore thank you so much for hanging out thanks guys appreciate it had fun